Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of ISAG, the Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee. Thank you for your attendance today. Um, just a reminder that this is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube later. We have received apologies from Lee Wood. Does anybody have any other apologies, please? Thank you. Yeah, apologies from Councillor Doyle. Right. Thank you for that. Um, so, item two, declarations of interest. Has anybody got any declarations of interest? No. Thank you for that, then. Item three, update from the chair. There is no update from the chair this time. Item four, responses to reports of the ISAC Scrutiny Committee, there are none of those at this time. And also item five, there are no matters that have been referred to us. So we will go straight to item six, the dual stream recycling quarterly update. And I understand we've had apologies from Nigel. Sorry. Can I ask why there are no previous minutes on the agenda? I didn't have time to publish them before the agenda. Right, that will be my fault then, but... <laughs> They'll be on the next. Yeah, <laughs> we, will, we will do them the next time, and you can imagine why I haven't seen them and haven't okayed them. Sorry about that. But we will make sure that we get them on the next time so that they can be scrutinised. Okay. Okay, because okay. it's very important that we are all happy with the previous minutes. So, yeah, sorry about that. On to the dual stream. And I understand we've got apologies from Nigel Harris, but we've got Steve G and Victoria Wood House here to give the report if you'd like to carry on. Thank you. Okay, good evening, all. Um, I'm obviously Steve, this is Vicky. Um, we've got a report to bring about the Joint Way Service. Uh, my apologies, it's not death by PowerPoint, but there is a lot of data. I think um, one of the keys about the service we deliver. It is data driven once the service is right. Um, some of the information that we've got across, it's worthwhile after the conversation, but it's worth absorbing, having a look at, and it starts to show some of the trends that are going on, not just across um, Tamworth, but across Litchfield and, uh, and Staffordshire as a whole. Um, so I do apologise that we are going to have a lot of facts and figures coming out for comparisons to try to make it manageable and, compare, um, and, and comparative. I've generally taken a period of a five-month period of this financial year versus the five months from the previous year, just to give you a snapshot of, of how we're going forward. Um, the good news is performance is stable. Um, the, the whole service is running pretty much as you would expect it to when you've got a, a bin lorry service and a recycling and waste service, so it, it's good news on that. Um, Cruise-wise, we're on budget, so again, there is some variance which I'll touch on later in terms of the, where we are against budget, but we are maintaining the operation to the, to the levels that were preset. Um, I, I did want to bring up, just so it's on, it's on people's radar, there's obviously been huge growth um, in the area, uh, both in Litchfield and Tamworth over the, over the past year, and that looks to continue. It's worth being aware of because the growth in figures does have an impact on the cost of the service and also the, uh, the, the tonnage that we produce. Um, however, to go on to some of the facts and figures, um, and a lot of it's good news, I'm pleased to report, uh, we had an average of 350 missed bins per month at the moment. Uh, if we compare that with the previous period, last year it was 736. Uh, Trust me when I tell you that there is a lot, a lot of work going on at the operational level and a lot of effort going in still to try and reduce those uh, figures further. Um, that's particularly focused on assisted collections, which, again, we do... I won't say mess up, that, that, that's a bit harsh, but we do get wrong, and when we do get them wrong, it does affect um, our vulnerable residents. Uh, complaints are down... Uh, over this period of this year, so we're down at an average of 1.6 complaints uh, per month versus an average of 11.6 in the corresponding year. Just to get that into some kind of perspective, 
the five month period that we're talking there's been over a million uh, collections so those small number of complaints shows that we're I, I believe we're doing a good job um, those complaints that we do get obviously we will deal with uh, I'll touch on blue bags because obviously in the past there have been issues in introduction of the blue bags we have got plenty of stock there it is available so if any residents do actually require additional they're available if I see um, we will get them out on, on request um, the new service and the dry recycling service the good news is that the majority the vast vast majority of our residents do do engage so um, and if you don't mind, I will separate the high-rise at the moment in terms of this. But if we go around the majority of our locations, so the, the housing estates and the communals, it's fair to say we have 98 90%, 99% uh, participation. So the vast, vast, vast majority of residents do engage. Um, did want to touch on the garden waste service. The calendar or the, the, the window is just closed for this year. And we did have a total of 44,000 uh, residents that subscribed to the service across both across both councils. Um, the percentage-wise, that was 65% Litchfield and 35% of Tamworth residents. I, I bring this up now because it ties in later with the green waste tonnage. Uh, it's nothing to be alarmed about. You've realistically only got to take a look at the urban uh, mix Tamworth service. 15 square miles, 12. 12 square miles, Litchfield's over 151 and Litchfield has a lot, lot more rural leafy areas, um, so that's why we get a lower, ta lower take-up of garden waste. Uh, contaminated bins, which I do like to touch on because we know we had the problems with the previous service on the single stream and the amount of loads we got rejected, uh, which did run into hundreds of thousand pounds worth of rejected loads. Uh, we still do get some contaminated bins, but the reality is that's a sign that the crews are actually doing the job and checking the bins when we go out. Um, we're averaging about 50, well, just under 1,600 bins per month, which again is down on 3,100 so from the previous year. So it's half of what we were getting. We don't want contaminated bins. One, it tends to frustrate residents whose um, recycling we don't take away. And secondly, we lose tonnage. So we do work on this. The, recycl um, the recycling officers do go out, they do visit people, they do try to give advice uh, and guidance to um, so we can sort of capture that, that recycling and get the numbers down. Um, the good news is on that, that the fact that they are actually stopping the contaminated bins is the quality of the product that we're producing. As a recycling officer, I can't stress enough that it is about quality and we need to collect the right product because it's the right product that goes into our recycling centres which gets the right, the correct amount of money for it and also gets recycled back into to, to meaningful products. Um, the good news is, and I'm sounding like a stuck record here because this was the same message last time, since the new service started we've had one rejected load and hands up that was an error at the depot, uh, we cross contaminated loading error. Um, if I compare versus the old service where we were in the region of £300,000 worth of rejected loads in a year, that is absolutely massive and is a sign that this service is actually working. Um, tonnage that I would like to go into, there are a number of appendices. Um, I won't go in huge detail line by line because um, the detail I always find with this is to be able the chance to actually look at it find your own little trends that's interesting then please do come back to us with any questions uh, but some higher level figures um, we're averaging 3,051 tonnes a month compared with 3,468 my apologies I've got that wrong we're averaging 3,122 tonnes a month that's versus 351 in 2022-23 um, there was a peak in 21-22 being the COVID years when everybody in the town when it's three and a half thousand. The reason I want that one to be sort of discussed is what's happening is residual tonnage is sneaking up. It's in everybody's interest around the country to get residual tonnage down. Residual tonnage is generally, for want of a better term, it, it's bad tonnage. It's stuff that's going off to um, energy from waves and being burnt rather than recycled. Um, 
So one of the drives that we will always have is to reduce that tonnage of, of, of low as we can per household. Headline figures for recycling, um, which includes garden waste, it was 40.5% in um, th this uh, last year compared to 43.4% the previous year. This is in line with the trends which you will see later on across Staffordshire and nationally. So unfortunately there has been a, a, a gradual decline in recycling. Our job is to try to book that trend and, and get us moving in the right direction again. It's fair to say as well, just on the joint waste service, uh, we're doing 1,213 tonnes of dry recycling, down on 1,270 tonnes on the previous year. Again, I can't stress enough that what we've actually seen is a small increase in residual and a small decrease in recycling. So we need to all work in that avenue. That's um, operationally, residents, councillors, members, everybody to try to get that, that, that um, trend reversed slightly. Um, I, I do stress again that that is a, a general trend, so we have seen curbside recycling fall about 18% over the last two, three years. So that has been occurring, we just need to, <laughs> to stop that trend. Reasons for that, numerous, people becoming disengaged, cost of living crisis, um, familiarity, there are numerous factors, but we, we, are, we are trying to address all those. Um, there is a campaign which is rolling out here before Christmas, uh, which I'm with our signing up for along with Litchfield, to try to engage with our residents to start touching on a, a general recycling campaign to, to try and influence behaviour. It is relatively light touch, but the good news is that once it's rolled out, it's a rolling campaign. If you therefore have anything specific that you want to want to better, um, bring to the party or you think we should focus on, we can certainly be, be, be discussed and we can see what we can uh, do moving forward over the coming months. The good thing I like about the campaign is it does engage, uh, we're trying to engage with residents, so rather than us saying, you must do that, we're actually trying to get residents to say, please do this, this is what we should do. Um, there's a lot around behavioural science that, uh, as people, we tend to follow our neighbours, we tend not to be the, the odd one out, so if we can actually get peers group pressure to influence it, it tends to be work a lot better than me going there and saying you must recycle. Um, there is a waft of data on this appendix that's in the pack. It's really interesting. It genuinely some really, really good data in there. It looks at the trends across Staffordshire, uh, across all the, the various districts. And, and starts to paint a picture about how we're comparing versus our neighbours. Um, headline figures, um, Tamworth's got 40.3% as the headline figure against an average of 44%. Staffordshire Moorlands is the top of the tree in terms of Staffordshire at 55.1%. There are differences. Staffordshire Moorlands produce a lot, lot more green waste. Staffordshire Moorlands are collecting some food waste. So there are reasons for the variance. Based on the demographic and the, the location, Tamworth is probably about on par where we'd expect it to be at the moment on dry recycling. Uh, which, which ties into the dry recycling rate. Um, like statistics, there's always some detail hidden behind them, but Tamworth always, well, for the past uh, three years, has topped the dry recycling rate in Staffordshire uh, at 27.4%. It's partly because we have a lower percentage of green waste, but the good news is that when you look at a trend, Tamworth does actually sit top of the bill on that one. Um, we do get the opposite with green waste for obvious reasons, 12.8% uh, of uh, composting and green waste in Tamworth versus an average of 23% across Staffordshire. But what you will find is areas like Stoke and Tamworth, which tend to be um, higher, higher urban areas have lower rates for, for, for reasons as less gardens. Um, I did mention residual waste earlier and it's one of the figures that I do quite like to see that Tamworth's on 129.4 kilograms per property. Uh, that's on the average within Staffordshire. Stoke tend to top the bill um, again for, for various reasons. 
Uh, you tend to find that Newcastle and Moorlands, because of our green waste and food waste, tend to have lower percentages. My real drive, if I can get onto the table that over the coming years, will to be how we can reduce that figure. Uh, it'll be the same message at Litchfield, that if we can reduce residual waste, we're in the right direction. Um, financial performance, um, and a slight apology from the Joint Waste Service, we've struggled because of resource around Litchfield to perhaps be as far forward as we should be in terms of our budget monitoring, but I have got an update about where we actually are. Uh, so last financial year there was an £194,000 overspend on the Joint Wave Service, uh, which on a £6.4 million budget isn't horrendous, but it's certainly still a significant sum of money. Um, of that £194,000, Tamworth share was seventy, well, it was £80,000 just under. Um, that's because currently, well, the split for all costs is worked out on property numbers. Um, again, that links into what I said about property growth earlier, because what's likely to occur is that property growth is going to occur in, in both Litchfield and Tamworth. Litchfield's going to have slightly more in terms of growth than Tamworth, so the percentage will change again slightly. It probably won't change the overall contribution, but it will change the percentage that, you, that, that, that the town will contribute towards it. Uh, period seven, and I do say this reservedly because it can change considerably, uh, hopefully for the better, there is currently a £75,000 overspend on the service. Um, however, I would add that at the moment we are waiting for quarter two income figures, and the income figures for the sale of dry recyclates can change massively. Um, I have known swings in previous positions of thirty, forty thousand pound a month, based on commodity prices that, unfortunately, we, we can't control. Uh, we have a mechanism which is fair, based on um, a, an index of let, let recycle. So we have a a normal, structured, acceptable level of what we get for our income. But it, but it is worth being aware that um, at the moment we've got a seventy-five thousand pound. Overspend on budget. Again, once a quarter two figures come out, I will get them across to Councillor Jay um, to start sharing where we'll have a, a, a far better idea of how we're going to um, the outturn for the year. Um, project wise, there is a lot going on. Um, I've mentioned the launch of the new recycling campaign. Um, We've got a round review that's currently started, so uh, Nigel, uh, apologies for not being here today, uh, but he's working on a round review. The reality is growth comes in, the rounds get out of kilter, that can suddenly put £100,000 additional costs into your, uh, in, into your, into your budgets uh, or the, sorry, into your expenditure. So Nigel is now doing a, a, a fair piece of work to try to actually find efficiencies in the round and make sure we are actually as effective as we can be. Uh, realistically, any changes that we do make won't happen until early 2024. We certainly wouldn't want to make any changes this side of Christmas when we go into the busy period. Um, if we do make changes, we will consult, but it is purely about trying to get the efficiencies to keep costs down. Um, a big piece of work that we're looking into to try to get a future strategy together is around... Um, Options that we have for strategy for the Joint Waste Service, um, you, you'll be aware that the government have announced recently on, well, well, basically that there is change of foot in, in terms of legislation, so food waste has been mentioned, uh, well, it is actually legis legislated, it's just when it will be introduced is an unknown at the moment. There has been talk uh, that green waste may become a... Um, free of charge service again. Um, you may have heard of the DRS system that went on in Scotland, which perhaps didn't work as well as it could have done. Uh, that's still on the agenda and extended producer responsibility. So at the moment, we've got all these things coming down the line. The reality is I don't think I've ever been as unsure as a waste professional about knowing what is going to occur. However, what we can't do is we can't rest on our laurels. So we're doing a a significant piece of work to start looking at the strategies so we can actually find out what the consequence will be should we have to introduce uh, a food waste service. 
next year, the year after, should we have to go for a mandatory greenway service. Um, so, interesting piece of work. It is the outcome of which should become available um, by the back end of next month. And again, as soon as we've got it, we, we will share it. With, you, you can see the meat, meat, meat on the bones. It will give you a budgetary idea of what that will do to costs, what it will do to your recycling rate, where any savings are available. Um, that ties in very nicely with the fleet is due for renewal um, on April 25. That is a substantial piece of work, so we are talking probably a contract hire in the region of eight and a half, nine million pounds that's, that's got to occur. So again, it's just to bring it onto the table so we know that it's it's coming. It's not a surprise, it's what comes in the cycle. The cost will be picked up by the contract hires that currently are, uh, but it's, it's just keeping keep in the loop that it is occurring. Um, the, we had questions last time we came to scrutiny about flats and uh, also our communal uh, properties. There has been a large piece of work that's uh, occurred on there. Vicky, you are probably far better placed to give an update on that than myself. Just as an update on that, yeah, all the um, communals, apart from the high rise, have now been put onto the dual stream recycling, so they all have paper and card and glass cans and plastic separately and to, that has been quite a good success we were there are some areas where we've had concerns there are areas where residents don't engage but we work with the residents and the housing provider whether that be in-house or out-house um, to make sure that residents know what they need to do and that's been completed so we haven't had many rejections in the communals so i think that's a positive And just following on from that, the high rises, which are the most difficult nut to crack, um, Vicky's team will be engaging with, with Tamworth's um, housing people to try to find a solution. Uh, we don't know that solution yet, but just to let you know, it is on the agenda. Uh, if we can tackle that and resolve it, oh, that, that's award time. That, that's you know that, that's really really quite positive stuff. But we are we are going to have a go at it. Okay. Hope that answers most questions I said. There is a level lot of data in there. And if anybody went have analysed it wants to come and ask any questions, I'll I'll happily uh, discuss. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Hello, thanks for that. I just wanted to just come in. Um, thanks for the update. I think you've undersold us a little bit there, I think. You know, complaints are down 87% compared to the past year, pretty the same period. Contaminated bins are halved. Okay, recycling percentage has deteriorated very slightly from 43 to 41, and there's a campaign being launched to address that. Residual waste is on target, dry recycling is on target. The service is largely on budget for the year compared to last year. So actually, it's a very positive um, situation. Uh, the contract hire point, that's standard at this point in the cycle anyway. And then um, I think we should just stress that the, the bit you mentioned about food waste, that is very, very unlikely at the moment to be next year based on the government kicking it down the road. So don't be alarmed by that. It could happen one day, but at the moment it's been kicked into the long grass. There's going to be a general election in the middle. Anything can happen. So it's, not, it's very, very unlikely to be next year, isn't it? Uh, just to agree with Councillor Jay, the good news is it's, it's far easier to come over here when it's a good news story because things are better than they were last year. Uh, we are in the right direction. And food waste... I genuinely have no idea. I would be surprised if it happens next year, so I would, I would agree with Councillor Jay there that uh, we will update when we, have, when we have an update. Thank you for that. Um, I have several questions. Sorry about that. Starting on the missed bins, the 350 missed bins, it's fabulous that it's come down. It, obviously, there's a lot of work gone into that. But... Do you know what the reasons are that we now do those miss bins? And what is the solution? What can we do? To, just, do, you, do you want to do my questions one at a time? Yeah, 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 do them one at a time. I'd appreciate it because my memory won't work otherwise. Um, Reality-wise, it, it's operational issues. Um, I had a conversation today with the operations uh, manager about, about why it occurs. And what you tend to find, that if you go out with a crew member that knows around like his back of his hands, it's, it's, it's a privilege. 
he goes, oh, yep, there's a bin there. He knows where everybody bin is. Oh, there's Mrs. So-and-so. She always comes out for a chat. There's so-and-so. So they know they're round and they know their customers. The problem comes that if we suddenly, for whatever reason, beat absence, holiday, we end up with a different crew on there. And I've been out there and done it myself uh, on, on, on the odd occasion very badly. Um, and you go out there and suddenly you completely miss that there's a bin there. Or so it, it tends to be human error. We do... Uh, in theory, particularly for the assisteds, we have a, a bar tech system, so we have an in, a, a cab, uh, um, um, an in cab system. So you have got on the screen in front of you saying, you know, 77 Church Street assisted collection. It's then whether we can communicate that message from the cab to the crew. So it, it tends to be human error. Um, if we do miss them, um, you do go back to the crews, you do explain, you do try and find out, to try and find the specifics of, of why it's gone wrong. Um, there's also an element, if I'm brutally honest, that if the crews don't confirm to say it as it wasn't presented and somebody then calls in and says, you didn't collect my bin. If our crews haven't said that it was missed, we accept that we're in the wrong and we go back. So you will have an element of those, not many I'm sure, because we've got very outstanding citizens at both places, where people have chanced their arms and we can't prove otherwise. That. I think my, my main concern was around the um, assisted ones because it, it's going to loom large, isn't it, in somebody's mind that the bin hasn't been collected. So, thank you. Yeah. Can I just add, we've, we've done a lot of work on the assisted collections, as Steve alluded to, and one of the things is that one of the supervisors has taken responsibility for that, and what he's doing is he's, we, we do a report on what's been missed, and he's engaging with all the crews, giving them a reminder, giving them a map, so that we can try and head that off. We know which ones are being misregulated and we're working on trying to prevent that. Thank you for that. Um, right, um, I think this might be on recycling then. You've said that you were, there's a, a project coming up, a, a launch of a new recycling campaign that's coming up. What exactly will that look like? And how do we educate people? Because for me, this is quite a big thing. If the if the percentages are going down, that 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 seems really bad. You know, in this day and age, we would expect more people to be taking it up. So if it's going the other way, it would be interesting to understand why and how we can amend it. Can I just my questions related to yours? The recycling campaign. Have we thought about going into schools? Because when my daughter lived at home, recycling was her job and she loved nothing more than putting the cardboard in the right place and the tins in the right place. So if we can educate children, they will educate the parents to a degree. That's, the, that's part of the plan. Um, we are still, it's still being developed and once it's ready to be rolled out, we want to come and show it you before it gets shared with everybody else. Um, but it is very much, we do this because, and it's a resident saying that, so I recycle because, and a child, there's a picture of a child saying I recycle because it's good for the planet, or I recycle because it saves me money, and there's, that's obviously not a child, but it's, it's all demographics, all ages, all residents, and they've actually gone out and spoken to people to get those f feedback and what, that will form the sound bites for some of the um, campaign. We'll look forward to seeing that when it gets to it then. Um, on to the food waste. Um, I'm, I'm hearing from both the officers and TJ that we don't really want the food waste thing to come in. I'm not quite sure why we don't want it to. Were we not looking to do this anyway? Because would it not be a good thing? And did we not do it a few years ago? I seem to remember Tamworth Borough Council having little... Um, buckets for food waste, yeah, in um, Mr Oates' senior times. Yeah, I think um, you can correct me here if I'm, I'm wrong. Um, there's a lot of budget constraints and pressures anyway at the moment to in introduce something like that when it's not mandated and be one of the first, you know, the front runners of it. Everything will be more expensive. Once it's something that's mandated and, you know, there's, there's lots of scale in it it should be arguably in theory be cheaper and that's the, the, the time to do it. that's that's the thinking behind it correct if i'm wrong there we do expect it 
for government to bring it in then at some point. Just to agree and expand on Councillor Jay's point there, um, we will have some idea of some costs involved in introducing food waste um, shortly. I, I worked at Newcastle Council, Newcastle and Lyme recently, where we ran a food waste service, and it was it was pretty successful. It was good. It's seen as a highlight. Um, it does cost money. It was costing considerable money. The the other oddity at the moment is that it's supposed to well, there's, there will be new burdens funding coming. Um, when that new burdens funding is coming, we do not know. But if you can put it, just to, very, to really simplify one element of it, if you go and buy 10 vehicles at £85,000 a, a shot, £850,000, and miss out on new burdens funding, that's six months, a year, 18 months down the line. Um, I, I'd certainly have that in great big letters and make sure that members were aware. Yes, thank you, Chair. I've, I've got a couple of questions, if I can, please. Um, you talked about the fleet needing replacing at some point, and we've known this for a while, haven't we? Do they all have to be replaced at the same time, or is it a rolling programme? I'm going to give an awful answer here, because that's a yes or no. Um, the, people do it in different ways uh, the problem that Litchfield have is that they are not uh, the joint way service my apologies I still do that from time to time uh, the problem that the joint way service has is that um, we've got we've signed up for a contract tire that's been ex extended so the vehicles are all going to come to the end of that contract tire period at the same time and we'll need replacing the good news is if we're paying fifty thousand pound for a truck now, We'll buy a new truck and the contract, I don't know, 53, 55,000, whatever it comes out at. So the actual annual cost won't change significantly. Um, there are pros and cons of running your fleet and replacing all in one hit versus a rolling program. So one from the economy of the scale of going out and buying, you know, 30 bin trucks tends to be cheaper uh, than going out and buying one at a time. Uh, operationally it's easy to bring in, in one it the the big negative tends to be that we've now got a fleet of old bin lorries and old bin lorries are more likely to break down than new ones um, so you do get to an age when seven eight nine year old bin lorries are running around that the operational cause problems because you will yeah your old cars break down more than your new ones um, so pros and cons but the good news is from the from the budget perspective you're not suddenly going to see a you know eight million, nine million pound hit in one year. It's gonna be gradual across the the next seven. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, that makes sense. Can I ask my other question? Well it's not a question really, it was something that we could say. Um that you've got areas where people still aren't complying or whatever your word you want to use. Would it be worth sharing that with members, the specific areas? Because it may be something that us as councillors could go out and speak to people in these areas or even, you know, put some sort of campaign out there ourselves? That's a very good idea. What I'll do is I'll ask the recycling officers who deal with that is that if there's a particular place where it's sometimes it just happens once and then it gets resolved and they, they rumble along and it's all very good for a while and then it happens again. But if we have any particular areas where it's, it's week on week on week, Yes, this should definitely be. It's a good idea to engage with the local ward councils as well and see what we can all do together. Because we engage with housing officers or the housing providers. So, yes, that would be a good idea. Thank you. Just to add on that, um, any engagement we can get from councillors of either district, any party that want to engage in recycling and help us push the message out to the residents, it's a shared aim that we should all be going to so the more buying we can get please please show it up and we'll we'll certainly support that and take advantage of it okay, thank you that, that, thank you um that was partly why i was asking about the campaign if it was then something that we could pick up on as councillors and th there is also an issue isn't there of seven and eight year old um, vehicles running around and how good they are for the environment i had tina next and then i'll call you in yeah, it was just on the back of Rosie's question, really. It will come of no surprise that I'm going to ask the EV question. Obviously, we are well behind as a 
Borough Council in EV vehicles and in our fleet. Um, Sheffield have got them, Exeter have got them. There are three main suppliers, um, that are Leyland Duff, well it's not Leyland Duff anymore, Mercedes and Renault. Um, where are we on the, on the journey to changing our fleet to EV and having the infrastructure in place to charge said vehicles? Um, in a nutshell, we, uh, we're a wee bit behind. Um, the problems that we, we have with EV is uh, if we take a, a standard, a standard um, RCV, so a standard RCV is going to cost around about £210,000. Uh, an electric RCV is going to cost around about £450,000. So budget-wise, that's taking a huge impact. Uh, one of the things that we are doing, we're in exactly the same position as the rest of Staffordshire. Um, so I was in a meeting last week with colleagues at East Staff, Stoke, Newcastle, and we're keeping it to the four of us at the moment uh, to try to put a strategy together about how we go about electrifying the depots. Um, the cost of electrifying a depot, and I'll say this from a previous place where I worked, it, it's a ridiculous difficult question to answer because the cost of actually putting a um, the, the cost to be able to electrify a depot and have the energy that you require to run a, a, a full fleet of um, RCVs is anything from um, £50,000 to oh, this is a ridiculous bit, £25 million. it depends where the source is it depends um, how much cabling you've got to run it depends on what infrastructure you've actually got. Uh, to the extent that one of the things that can happen is you try to electrify a depot and it actually means you close the depot and start again. Um, but it is being explored. It's a really interesting concept um, and reality for some. Um, I don't believe we'll get any further on the next batch of uh, when we come to replace the fleet other than you know, potentially one or two flagship vehicles that could be considered uh, whole scale. Operationally, they wouldn't do the job for us. We'd break down before we got back to the depot because we'd run out of juice. Potentially, there are ways around that. Um, so the EV scenario is there to be looked into. Um, other options as well that are worth considering. Um, Mike Wilcox over at... Um, Litchfield has just got something from the Moon Society coming to give a, a conversation on hydrogen. Um, so there is a session running, a policy down of the date to hand, um, where somebody's coming across to discuss hydrogen. If anybody wants to come across them, they are more than welcome. Really interesting concept. Again, hydrogen I would love to do, but you're talking £800,000 for a truck. And on a personal level, when I went up to Kill University and they got an electrolyzer, which meant that we could actually produce hydrogen getting it off the ground and getting them to buy into it because the commercial venture was, was was hard work. The other sort of sticking plaster solution that some have uh, gone along the lines of is um, hydro-treated vegetable oil, which we put into a fleet at Newcastle previous place. That could be done, that could be done tomorrow, uh, but it comes at a cost. So ballpark figure, uh, not to be quoted, but I'm not a million miles off by any stretch, is around about £150,000 to put hydrogenated vegetable oil into the joint waste fleet. That would reduce your carbon emissions by around about 90%. Um, you, your NOx would come down and your PM particles would also come down uh, by considerable levels. But it, it's, it's a cost and there are other debates about um, whether HVO is, is, is the solution. Uh, but the, the EV stuff, what, what I'll happily do is, is, is keep you afloat of what occurs, but um, we're, we're not actually very far forward at the moment. Okay. Sorry. Just oh, to, that's just been pointed out. We have, good point. We have got a couple of small vans. Um, so we have got a, we, we have got a couple, and, and in fairness, anybody wishing to bring in vans under three and a half tonne on electric proven technology works. Yeah, just to say everything comes at a cost, but it's yeah. the long-term future we need to look at. Not today, not tomorrow, but the future of my grandchildren and your grandchildren that we need to look at. So, yeah, whilst I agree it comes at a cost, the long-term savings 
of having an EV vehicle outweighed the initial cost by tenfold, just on an electric vehicle that I've got, what you pay out every year is is way less than you when you when you look at it as a long term plan. Thanks for that. I just find it quite disappointing that it, it's in the too hard box. You wanted to come in, TJ. Yeah, I was going to say it's 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 easy to look at it as what you you both just alluded to there, but like it's too hard to not be done. That's that's not that's not quite the case. It's that again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the industry itself is not rushing to that as a solution because by the time everyone's done it, that is likely to not be the solution anymore, and everyone will have run and put the outlay, and it's not the solution. So the H is it HVO, the hydrogenated vegetable oil, um, is one for example that's talked about that gets you almost the same. Uh, reduction in emissions etc for a fraction of the cost so it's already been looked at it's just not something we can run out if we, do, if we made the decision based on um, you know just wanted to do it first we'd have made it probably a year ago and now have a massive outlay of cost that actually is useless in a couple of years so you need to just step back a little bit and um, do what do us right and like you know HVO is one that's talked about as potentially being the solution so it's not that we, it's not there's not a will to do it. It's not that anyone's thing is too hard. It's just that we don't want to rush into the wrong one and then find that actually it's, it's useless in a couple of years, which is how it looks at the moment. But we need to make a move. We're yeah. not moving at the moment. We're stationary. We've not made any headway into any sort of hybrid hydrogen, EV or anything. We're driving around, or well, I'm not, but they're driving around in vehicles that are over 10 years old and you have to look at, they're driving down a street, my street for example, it's got kids in that street, they're not driving at huge speeds, they're on tick over while the bins are being emptied, how much is that polluting our atmosphere? So whilst I agree with you, and I agree with you Steve about costs, and to me it's really disappointing that we had this conversation a year ago, but where are we from last year to this year? There doesn't seem to be any movement. And whilst I agree, you know, whether it's hydrogen, hybrid or whatever, we've not made any steps in the right direction to actually do anything. Because we could have had a hydrogenated vegetable or vehicle like that. But we haven't. Sorry. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree with you. It, it's just a shame that we can't get any further forward with it. And we haven't seen what the difference in the cost would be that a, a decision could be made on it. Uh, just and it's, it's just that those... You know, that many wagons, and they're all of the same age. You know, perhaps it would be a good idea if it was done piece by piece, but you say that's more expensive. You wanted to come back, Steve? Just to agree with the, the, the points that you're making. Um, it is in the hard-to-do box, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. Um, I'm intrigued to see what comes out of the work we're trying to do with our colleagues in... Um, that I mentioned before, the staffs, uh, Stoke um, and Newcastle. And it will be intriguing to see what actually comes out of that. Um, I've got increased, personally, I've got quite frustrated because we don't seem to be able to get the answer to that first question about saying, well, OK, how much, if you want to put a term, how much juice can we get onto our site? Um, when we've got the answer to that, then I think we're in a situation where we can have the debate about, OK, can we afford that? What's the whole life cost of the vehicle? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, it, it's, we need to, uh, as, an, as a joint way service and as a county, answer that question. And when we find out what capacity we've got in our depots and what we can do, then we can start to have some debate about where we can take it going forward. I will add as well, just to, to back the, the points of the two colleagues in there, said HVO... Although I always refer to it as a sticking plaster, literally you could, you could do it tomorrow. It, it just comes at a, it comes at a cost. Thank you for that. It just seems that you know perhaps that initial work should be done quite quickly about what the capacity is there. And if you know if it was joined up with the county, with other districts of the county, perhaps there would be some economies of scale. And the places that Tina has you know, said of already running it, there must be ways that they get around the problems. So perhaps we need to be asking, you know, how it is that you get around the problems. TJ, do you want to come in? I was going to say that it, it's not because it's difficult. 
We've already shown since, particularly since May, that any difficult decision we are making, we're debating, be that publicly or behind closed doors, there's some things that some people in here know, the very difficult things. We're not procrastinating on anything, so it's not because it's difficult. Um, there are just many things to consider. Let's take EV, so you, everyone talks about their own EV charging at home. Commercial energy is a lot more expensive than your, your residential energy. Three, four, five, sometimes six times more expensive. So you can't just compare, it's not comparing apples with apples. Um, and the fleet is due for renewal, as we talked about. Just renewing the fleet, let's assume you did nothing else other than re re get new vehicles. That would reduce emissions in itself compared to an old fleet. So I'm not suggesting we do nothing, but newer cars emit less. That's just the, the nature of it. So we're not hiding when because hard. It's just, it's got to be the right decision. Um, otherwise, we're going to, in less than eight, nine years, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll have a dud fleet on our hands that it's expensive to run and we'll have at the outlet. As we said, we're not hiding from anything, but um, we're not going to be pressured to run, rush into the wrong one either. Sorry. When we talked about the growth of the two districts, um, the amount of houses that are being built, Will that, when you've done your review, will that ultimately mean more wagons and more operatives? Yes. Uh, rough rule of thumb, if, uh, and, and this is only a, uh, a rough figure, uh, but if you work on 1,500 properties equals one bin lorry or one recycling truck. Um, so, yes, we, we grow, we, we cover more miles. The high rise um, issue. Have you any idea what the solution to that is? Because having been in there and seen how they <clears throat> deal with their waste, how different it is to us at home, how do we sort out the um, the recycling and the you know our blue bags and whatever it is what we use that you know would seem to be quite a big problem for them. Thank you. Um, we have had discussions with colleagues at Tamworth. We have looked at different suggestions, whether it be a bring site, whether they utilise the sheds in the basement and put some bins in there. Um, we need to chase that up with our colleagues. They were going away and having a look and seeing what was feasible and what wasn't. So I'll re-engage and try and find out. I think there's been a bit of a staffing change as well, so I need to know who I need to speak to about it. But yeah, we'll get on to that. Thank you. I mean, I can imagine for some of the folk in um, the high rise, or doing this may be, you know, a, a task too much. But there will still be lots of people in there who will be keen to be taking part and and doing their bit for the recycling. So yeah, if that can carry on being looked at, that would be brilliant. That at least that's coming on as well. Has anybody? Sorry, Paul. Thank you, Chair. It's just in relation to Miss Bin statistics, really. I'm just quite intrigued about uh, recording of it. So if somebody in an apartment complex reports a missed bin, is that recorded as just one bin missed? Or is it the number of bins within that complex? Because it seems more realistic that if that one bin has been missed, they've all been missed. So I'm just wondering about the recording of statistics in relation to that, please. Thank you. The way it's currently recorded is if one person reports a missed bin, it's classed as one bin. Because some, it, it would, it might only be one bin within that complex. It, if it's more, then we would, we would have to, we wouldn't know until we got there. So it is just recorded as one. It's a, recorded as a missed bin collection. So it's it's per hundred, it's per thousand properties, isn't it? So it's it's evened out. Yeah. So, in fairness, you could end up with an oddity where you get a one person reports a missed bin where there were six presented, and when we get back out there, there are six bins that we've missed. So, that's, you could get oddities on it, but we, we work on the idea of it being one. Would it to bring? I don't want to push it because you've got some great figures in there and some great progress and things like that. I'm just trying to get to a point where it's a little more realistic, maybe, you know. Would it be a case of the 
you know, when the bin trucks were out, if they could then clarify, well, you've missed eight bins, actually, would that not make the figures more realistic? Um, the crews should actually say uh, what's been... Um, if, if, if the crews have a non-presented bin, they should actually present it, uh, that, that they will actually put it onto Bartek and that will come up as a non-presented bin. I see where you're coming from now. The idea is if we actually go back out, but I miss bin and there's eight there, I don't, is there a way to be the back on Bartek? I don't actually know. Not into the service request, because we, we take our figures from the service request that comes through as opposed to any detail that's within that. But we can certainly look at it. No, I, I, thanks for looking at it. I just think it's important we get actual data, real data, um, because with the, the figures that you've given, great figures, but in reality, it's probably different to that. Um, you know, and, and, and we are after, you know, consistency and correct figures and correct reporting and that. I just think if we could have a look at it, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, just to clarify that, to be fair, the, the incidences of missed communal bins is a lot lower than missed individual ones. So a lot of... So, so there wouldn't be a lot of... We don't often miss communal bins. Okay. So I live in an apartment and when I report a missed bin, there's actually nine bins missed. But they have nine individual bins? Yeah. Nine individual black bins and nine individual, sorry, not nine individual blue and purple ones, but there's about that figure split between the two of them. So that's where I'm coming from, from the reality of reporting. Um, they are individual bins. So is that something that we should look to be recording on? Yeah, we can certainly look at that. Thank you. Has anybody else got anything they want to raise on this? Right, we are being asked to note the update on the sorry I was right so yeah we're being asked to note the update on the performance of the dual stream recycling service do i need to read that bit as well no well, no obviously it's like yeah you want to come in tina and um if we can have when you bring the next report back to us what we've looked into regarding all the other sources of fuel in a vehicle, EV, hydrogen, vegetable oil, etc., with some data behind it, because we're another year down the whole line and we still haven't got that data. Yeah. And I'll look for a seconder, sorry. Can I just get your word in, Tina, again? Could you just say it again for me? We've got note, which I hate anywhere on the yeah, board, so I hate that word. Note the update on the performance of the dual stream recycling service and that the next report includes data on information sourced on how we fuel our next fleet of vehicles. So we've looked into EV, we've looked into hydrogen, we've looked into all alternative oil. sources. All alternative sources, eh? so yeah. you can put it better than me. And I look for a seconder. Everyone in favour? Yep, carried. So, thank you for that. Do you want to Oh, yes, we, we were going to um, ask um, the committee if you still feel we need this report quarterly or if you you'd still want it quarterly, right? We are at that then. Yep. The committee want it quarterly. That's fine. Thank you. And then just say why the others is the Yeah. So I'm very happy if you want to leave now. Thank you so much for your report. And sorry if we've given you a hard time, but everybody's quite passionate about this. So we are we on to the So we're going to do um, your forward plan. Right. And the working group and scrutiny before we go in. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Thank you. So next um, item, members, is the forward plan. Which is the, the forward plan, isn't that? Is it? I always pick that up. So, are there any items that the committee have looked at on the forward plan that they want to bring forward? No. Right. Um, item eight, then the working group updates. Um, the housing repairs one we think is going to be changed. 
Then the first of November. Yeah, it's same price on the first of November, but, but we also a yeah. plan on schedule. We think that will be changed. The migrant travelling community one, we did have a date in the diary, but we've had to um, postpone that. So we'll be putting a new date in the diary. Did you have anything from Bentina about the HGV? No, we need to chase that up then, don't we? So I think that's a, if you can put that down, that's a big chase up on all of those okay. groups so that we can um, get something done. So on to the, um, the work plan and the action log, which you've all got a copy of. Is there any comments on that? So what's it? It's the decamp yeah, policy. It's like right, the decamp policy that we talked about last time, um, that's going to cabinet. cabinet, yeah? So when will we be looking for that? Will we be so looking for it to come here like, at all? Yeah, so um, it was agreed that they'd do like a post-implementation review, sort of maybe six months down the line. Yeah. So, yeah. so we'll, we'll keep that on yeah, the work plan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got these these other ones that are on our work plan. Plan um, town hall proposals. Do we want to keep that on? I think that might be worthwhile. Actually, I don't know what everybody else thinks, but if there is going to be some work done here, we would like to be knowing what's going on. Yeah, where is yeah, it? I think we ought to keep it on um, because we need to know at what stage it's at. It's at. If any, because I've not heard anything at all. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to keep... Yeah, there's, there's nothing happened at the moment, but obviously we want to know when something does happen. Um, the fire safety update, why were we questioning that? It, at some point it's been asked. Oh, right. Do you still want it? Paul Weston's happy to... Yes, yes, yeah. we do, don't we? We want the fire safety update. Um, the Another one that we've got on our TBC list is the assembly rooms is <laughs> does anybody on the committee know why we'd got that because that would seem to be a done deal the only thing i thought of um but i don't know if it would be our committee would be a, a review on the viability of it how it's going is it working are we doing all that we need to do so it, it's a case of whether it wouldn't be us right so we need to we're happy for that to come off then, but we need I need to make sure that it is somewhere else so that it's been looked at. Yeah. Right, we now go to exclusion of the press and public, and I am reading this bit, that in accordance with the provisions of the local authorities' executive arrangements, regulation 2012 and section 100A.4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as divine, defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12A to the Act and the public interest in withholding the information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public. Do I have a mover? We're going to have to get a shortened version of this. Thanks, Rosie. A seconder. Thank you, Tina. All those in favour? Right. 